So we're still responding to Jaronism, same as last video. Let's get right into it. Um, let's see, we don't mention uh, that there's no cameras on the moon looking back at Earth, because if we can get to the moon so easily, we can put all these robots there, we can put the LRO to go around and take pictures, we can do all that. What a godsend it would be to sit a camera on the moon, face the Earth, there'd be no more questions about eclipses, we could show it in all the schools, but they don't have it. Wonder why. First off, the LRO did take pictures of the Earth from space. Uh, secondly, Jaronism here wants cameras on the moon for purposes like to have no more questions about eclipses. But flat earthers are the only such people that have such questions. And the thing is, NASA isn't out there to prove themselves to you. They're not using their multi-billion dollar a year budget to try to prove to the masses that the Earth is a globe. That's not what they're doing. They're doing genuine scientific research, observation, and development in space, space travel, and air travel. They're some of the best in their fields, literal rocket scientists. So tackling conspiracy theories is not a high priority. But the question remains, why are there no cameras on the moon looking back at Earth? Well, why would there be? Like I said, everything that NASA launches, that they observe, or that they plan, is for a reason. It's for scientific research, or development, or for preparation for something else. So what really could we learn scientifically from a camera permanently placed on the moon looking towards Earth? And would we be learning enough to justify spending all that money to send cameras to the moon? What I'm saying is that they don't have enough reason to do such a thing, especially when you consider how difficult it would be to get a lander to land on the correct spot on the moon and constantly stream data back to Earth to be collected. That would all be really complicated and for what? So that conspiracy theorists like you can have a peace of mind? No. But there are pictures of a solar eclipse from the moon. And here is footage of a lunar eclipse from the moon. And that's from JAXA, Japan's aerospace and space agencies. And for a long time, we've had pictures of the Earth from the moon in general. First from us, the US, then from the Russians, then from Japan, then Europe, then maybe China and then India, and then China if they haven't already. China's real secretive about this for some reason. Oh, what's that you say? They're fake? They don't look good enough for you? You're still not convinced, and you think it's more reasonable to think that all of these governments are involved in a huge conspiracy? Yeah, that's what I thought you'd say. How about the fact that there's no 24-7 video feed of the Earth from the craft that's in orbit of the Earth? Nope, it's on the dark side sometimes, so we gotta shut off the cameras. Otherwise, we'd have to, like, beam them off satellites back to Earth. Ooh, that'd be way too hard. Yeah, actually, it would be really difficult to get a completely uninterrupted 24-7 stream from a satellite that's moving pretty fast around the Earth. Even if they're beaming it off other satellites, it's still pretty difficult to always have good line of sight. I guess they could hypothetically send other satellites in such a trajectory that they would always have good line of sight, but that wouldn't be worth it at all just for the purposes of a 24-7 livestream that, quite frankly, NASA wouldn't really get much use out of. And launching satellites is pretty expensive, so... That being said, the cameras are on when the ISS is on the night side but the image looks black because it's dark. That's really it, and they explain that on the stream's website. Sure, there are things like stars and light pollution that we're not seeing, but those things are actually pretty dim, and it's difficult for a normal camera at normal settings to pick any of that up. And these are normal, consumer-grade, commercially available cameras, apparently. Look, the HDEV, that's High Definition Earth Viewing, that's like the official name of this stream, but it was meant to be a simple experiment. All they wanted to do was tack some cameras onto the ISS and have them running by themselves without having to adjust them. 
and see how the camera quality changes over time. That That's the whole purpose of the stream. And hell, high schoolers helped with it. And it's apparently operated by teams of students. I mean, it sounds to me like a decent learning opportunity, but no reason to go all out. Again, they're not exactly trying to prove themselves to you. Uh, don't mention uh, that there's boats over the horizon. Mm, big mistake there, but it wasn't mentioned by IFL Science. Yeah. The fact that, hey, you know when boats go away, they disappear behind what looks like the horizon to your eye. Pull out your camera, zoom in, and there's the boat again. Yeah, imagine that. It didn't actually go over any curve, did it? They don't mention that. Except they still go over the horizon after you use a zoom lens or a telescope. Look at this image from Andy Hall on silverwartalk.com. It's one of my favorites. Here is the Dennis Sullivan, a replica schooner, also over the horizon. Sure, it can be difficult to see these ships with a naked eye, but that's not the entirety of our argument. They still genuinely do go over the horizon. It seems like your understanding of our argument is, after a while, we can't see it anymore. And that's what you're arguing against, but that's not the case. Yeah, leave out the uh, idea of plane flights that make no sense on the globe, ones that travel from southern South America up north to, say, Frankfurt, and then down to Dubai or uh, down to Johannesburg. Don't mention any of that. Uh, that might make people look into it. It's hard to find any international flight that doesn't go through Europe, the U.S., or both. You know why? because they have lots of very busy airports that have lots of arrivals and lots of departures. Let's say that you run a small, not-so-busy international airport somewhere in Australia, right? How many of your passengers are going to be going to Chile? Probably not very many. Would it make sense to have one flight with that's like less than half full of people going straight to Chile? Or would it make more sense to put them on a busier flight to Germany, where they can meet all of the other people that are going to Chile? By doing that, they'd have to book less flights altogether, and it's much more cost-effective. Instead of having many, many smaller flights to lots and lots of places, it makes more sense to have fewer flights that are all going to one of a few places where it can be more easily sorted out and they can send people to more places from there. However, there are a number of international flights that are flown solely across the Southern Hemisphere, and those flights take a path farther south than you might expect, and that's because of the globe shape of the Earth, which makes the shortest distance between those two curved on a flat map, a path that would be totally impractical and wasteful on a flat Earth. Um, how about the lack of undersea cables from Australia or New Zealand to South America, or the lack of cruises between the same two places? They don't mention that at all. Look, even on a globe, Australia is pretty far away from South America, so it would make a lot more sense to have cables connected to Asia instead, because it's much closer, and cruises from Australia to South America would take forever. Cruises don't typically go very far, especially not straight away from any and all land. It just wouldn't make sense. Don't mention the Earth.NewSchool site removed the AE map uh, once people started to catch on to the fact that everything made sense on the AE map. Um, they didn't mention that, did they? As far as I can tell, this site was created and is run by one guy, a Cameron Beccaro, if that's how it's pronounced. He is the one who would decide which projections to use. Are you saying that he knows that the Earth is flat, and he's trying to cover it up for some nefarious reason, that he's part of this conspiracy? Or is it more likely that he got fed up with flat earthers and decided to remove it? You also say that the azimuthal equidistant projection, or the common flat Earth map, makes more sense, but I don't see how, nor do you give much of an explanation. If you go to the site, you'll see that wind largely travels in a different direction at the poles than at the equator, and ocean currents are stronger around the equator. 
And that is caused by the Coriolis effect, because the Earth is a rotating globe. Okay, here's a bit of an edit to explain the current on the equator. It's flowing eastward, where it seems like the Coriolis effect would cause it to flow westward. However, the Sverdrup theory explains this. Basically, it's caused by the fact that the northern hemisphere is rotating counterclockwise, whereas the southern hemisphere is rotating clockwise. However, there is an undercurrent that is flowing westward, and that is mostly affected by the Coriolis effect. This sort of stuff gets really complicated. They didn't mention that the jet streams on a flat earth make sense versus the supposed 300 mile per hour easterly jet stream in the south that is spinning 300 mile per hour faster than the earth in the direction that the earth spins. That's still a big one and people can't grasp it. Take a basketball, spin it on your finger, and then realize if that was the earth that there has to be a wind going in the same direction as the earth 300 miles per hour faster than it. Does that make sense to anybody? Sure, shouldn't. Ah, here Jaronism has discovered the polar vortex, or at least the one in the South Pole. See, at both poles, at very high altitudes, there can be lots and lots of wind, more so in the South. It's not like this disproves the globe, though. We've known about this for a long time, and we do have an explanation. See, the poles are very, very cold, and that causes air to fall and get very, very dense. This is in contrast with the equator, in which heat causes air to rise and be less dense. And when these two meet, lots and lots of wind. Weather can be pretty complicated. But wind isn't only affected by the rotation of the Earth. It's also affected by temperature, air pressure, and how land and water uh, release heat differently. Neat stuff if you ask me. But if the Earth was flat and stationary, with Antarctica being on the outer rim and stretched out in comparison, then this vortex would be traveling faster, and for little reason. Seriously, if the Earth looks like this, then why would wind be traveling in a circle around it? What's pushing it that way? And why wouldn't it be traveling more up and down, or even north and south? It doesn't seem like this phenomenon is any better explained on the flat Earth. And now we are about halfway through the video, but this is where I leave off this one. So, maybe I'll do another one next week? Maybe not. But at any rate, stay tuned for more anti-flat Earth. At any rate, thank you for watching. It's goodbye.